I think for all of us there are times and events that help us remember special memories, some good and maybe some bad. I'm going to list off a few dates or uh, holidays, and I, I want someone um, to tell me, um, what does that help you remember? September 11th. What does 9-11 have you remember? Twin Towers. Twin Towers. An attack, attack on our country. Um, what about February 14th? Does that mean anything? Love. Okay. What about um, second weekend of March? <laughs> That's a basketball fan right there. <laughs> Men's Summit. Men's Summit. Yes, yes. There are a number of special days in our life. I, I remember I was... Uh, can't remember the exact topic, but one sermon I was talking about those special days, and I listed them off, and it included things like August 20th, which is our wedding anniversary, and the, the dates of our children's birthday, March 18th and July 16th, and then I said, um, um, November 17th, my wife's birthday, and she raised her hand, she says, it's October 17th. <laughs> <laughs> kind of ruined the whole point. Uh, <laughs> Well, for the Jews in Jesus' day, Passover was that special time to remember God and to remember his deliverance of them from slavery in Egypt. And even though it was hundreds of years before, it was something they continued to remember. And if you know Jewish people today, that still is the main holiday. The most important one is Passover. And so as we're continuing in the Gospel of Mark in our series that we've been doing for a little over a year now, we come to the point where Jesus is celebrating Passover for the last time with his disciples. And it was a special time because it was Passover, but it was also a special time because it was their last Passover with Jesus. And he used Passover as a way to remember him. And so it became almost like a, a different holiday. And the way he changed it, we continue to observe and to celebrate today as Christians. And we call it communion or the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table. And so in Mark chapter 14, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be picking up in verse 12. And in verse 12, we see the preparations for this final Passover that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. And I'm just going to go ahead and read verses 12 to 16 of Mark 14. On the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and prepare the Passover so that you may, you may eat it? So he sent two of his disciples and told them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will, will meet you, follow him. Wherever he enters, tell the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make the preparations for us there. So the disciples went out, entered the city, and found it just as he had told them, and they prepared for Passover. How interesting. In the midst of a, a gospel with so much in it, why would the Holy Spirit inspire Mark to write these words? Why are these included in the gospel accounts? What's significant about what seems like just some mundane details? Well, there are some important points I think we need to understand. The first is uh, the time. This was the first day of the Festival of Unleavened Bread, it said. It was Thursday of Passion Week. So Jesus, if you know Passion Week, you know he's going to be crucified on Friday. We call that Good Friday. And so this Passover feast and this festival of unleavened bread were reminders of how God delivered their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. And we talked about that a little bit last week, how the Israelites were told they were to take a lamb and slaughter it and take its blood and, and put it around the doorposts of, of their house. 
And in this tenth and last plague, God sent his angel to kill the firstborn son of each of the households in Egypt. And that was, it seems so extreme, but Pharaoh's heart was so hardened and he wouldn't listen to Moses, he wouldn't listen to God, he wouldn't allow the people to be delivered and that was the only way it was going to happen because you see, the firstborn son of a Pharaoh is thought to be God. He is going to be the next God in that country. And so because of this, the Israelites were constantly reminded, we were enslaved at one point, but God delivered us. And it was through the blood of a lamb. For the Galileans, uh, this holiday was celebrated on Thursday. And for those in Judea, the southern part of Palestine or Canaan, um, they celebrated on a Friday. And you might say, well, why is that important? Well, as you read through the gospel accounts, it seems like there's some contradictions as you read John's gospel and the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they talk about different days. And part of it had to do with how people counted days. Some people, like, like us today, we, we count days. Technically, we count it from midnight is, is morning, actually, right? Um, and then we, we use the, the clock, the 12-hour 12, 12 clock, 24-hour clock. Uh, but those, uh, in those days, they had different ways of counting days. And some counted a day from sunset um, to the next sunset. Others counted it from sunrise to sunrise. And so there was a little bit of a confusion on when you're talking about a certain day, what part of the day you're actually talking about. But anyway, the reason why this is important is it made it possible for Jesus to celebrate Passover with his disciples as Galileans on Thursday night and still be crucified as the Passover lamb on Friday because they were in Judea, just outside of Jerusalem. And the whole reason this is significant is because of the prophecies, because of what was written in the Old Testament that said what will happen to the Messiah. So Jesus is making plans with his disciples. His disciples, um, two of his disciples, are given the responsibility to prepare the Passover, to get the right place, and he tells them all about it. And so at this point, uh, it seems like the details are somewhat secret. I don't know if you were listening or you're paying attention as he tells these two disciples what to do. He didn't say, we're going to go meet on, you know, 746 16th Street for, for Passover. No, he said, you guys go into the city, look for a guy that's carrying a jar of water, and follow him. And then he goes on to say where he goes, follow along with him, tell him where's the guest room where uh, the teacher is going to have Passover with his disciples. And so... Basically, what's happening here, one of the other gospel accounts said those two men, those two disciples, were Peter and John. And they're to go into the city, and this is a huge city. There's millions or thousands and thousands of people that are there to celebrate Passover, and they're to find a man carrying um, water. How in the world are you going to decipher, you know, between all the people there to find a man that's carrying water. Well, we probably would never have thought of this, but back in those days, men didn't carry the water. Women carried the water. Remember about the woman at the well? The women were the ones that went and got the water. And so to find a guy carrying water, it'd be like, this is weird. Why is he carrying the water? Well, that's the guy. That's the secret sign. And so they knew that he was the one they were to follow. And it says that they found it just as he said, exactly as he said, and they prepared the Passover meal. Um, and this would be an important time for Jesus to instruct his disciples. And the other gospels don't have this, but in John chapters 13 to 16, he goes into all kinds of details, including about the coming of the Holy Spirit and all kinds of other things to prepare them for after he was gone. But before we get to that, I think it's important for us to apply this to ourselves. And what I wrote down in application is, as the events of Jesus' life 
especially his betrayal, suffering, death, and resurrection, were fulfilled according to God's plan, so also we can have assurance that he has a plan for our lives that will be fulfilled. I don't know about you guys, but when I read the Gospels, over and over again, I, I see that Jesus did this to fulfill prophecy, or, or this was done to show that he was the Messiah, or these specific events happened in this specific order because the prophets had said they would. And to me, that's an assurance that Jesus' life was not an accident. His crucifixion wasn't a mistake. It wasn't like the plans got all haywire and all of a sudden he's going to get crucified. This was all according to plan. That God has a plan. God had a plan for Jesus and he has a plan for us. And I don't know about you, but that's helpful. When I'm going through hard times, it's helpful to know that God has a plan. And we talked about that a lot at the Men's Summit with uh, one of the songs that our, our guys picked out uh, about how when life seems to be uh, falling apart, it's really falling into place. And that's an assurance that we can have, that no matter what we're going through, we can know that God has a plan for our lives. And one verse that probably a lot of you are familiar with, but I don't know about you, I need to hear it often. It's Romans 8, 28. It says, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. All things. Good things, bad things, terrible things, tragedies, hurts. All those things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And then also in Ephesians 1.11, it says, In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. Have you heard people say that God has a purpose? This is what this verse is talking about. God works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. And you know, to me, that's such an assurance. We all have plans, don't you? Some of you probably have plans, detailed plans for this afternoon. Um, maybe it includes a nap. Maybe it includes where you're going to go eat. Some of you are shaking your head, nap. Yeah, sounds good. In fact, let's start right now. No. Uh, it's one thing to have a plan. It's another thing to be able to fulfill it. I've had plans that haven't happened. I mean, when I was 14, I was sure I was going to be playing for the Lakers. It didn't happen. I couldn't make it happen. Maybe there was a Lakers team for junior hires that I could have done. But um, it's one thing to have a plan. It's another thing to be able to fulfill it. God will fulfill his plan. He has the power. He has the authority. He, he has the ability to fulfill his plans. And I don't know about you, that's encouraging. That no matter what I'm going through in my life, I can rest in the fact that God's got this. God's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And he's working it out. Well, the next section, Jesus goes on, continuing almost a little bit with this theme of God's plan, as he predicts his betrayal. In verse 17, it says, When evening came, he arrived with the twelve to this upper room. While they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who's eating with me. They began to be distressed and said to him one by one, Surely not I. He said to them, It's one of the twelve, the one who is dipping bread in the bowl with me. For the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. So can you imagine this? This is somewhat of a celebration, a remembering, thinking about how God delivered uh, their people uh, in the past, and thinking about the fact that a Messiah, the Savior, uh, is amongst them. And he says, one of you are going to betray me. And again, this once again shows Jesus' ability to know the future. But it also, to me, it tells me his willingness to submit to the Father's will, even when it's terribly painful. Can you imagine 
being betrayed by your closest friends. Maybe you've actually experienced that. These ones that Jesus was building into, that he was training and teaching to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, one of them was going to actually betray Jesus. We know the story that actually all of them forsook him. They didn't stand by him to defend him when he was arrested. Um, but one specifically, one of the 12, would actually betray him to the religious authorities. And I find it so interesting that they respond with shock and each one says, is it I? Or in this translation it says, surely not I. That's the emphasis there. And, and I'm struck by their humble acceptance that they could fall. That they were questioning, it, it isn't me, is it? And to me, that shows a certain amount of humility. I, I think if it was a proud person, they'd say, well, don't have to worry about me. I'm not going to be one of them. This guy, maybe him, not me. But they, didn't, they weren't like that. They knew that they had messed up so many times. They knew that they disappointed Jesus so many times for their lack of faith. And so in their humility, they, they said, oh, please, it surely isn't I. So Jesus repeats for the third time that it is one of the very ones in their midst sharing that meal. And the fact that it was one of his closest friends makes this act of betrayal even worse. You see, sharing a meal meant fellowship. It meant peace. It meant brotherhood. That in that culture and in that time, you don't share a meal with your enemies. You only share a meal with those that you're at peace with. Yet an enemy of Jesus was there. He'd infiltrated the group and he was there. Jesus declares that his fate will be according to the written word of God. Did you notice what, what he said there? He said, um, for the Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. He knew God had a plan. He knew God would fulfill that plan. He knew that there were prophecies of the Messiah being betrayed. But there's a, a big but here. But the one betraying him will face a worse fate than never being born. Wow. And I don't know. I, I know some scholars believe that Jesus told this to the disciples while Judas was there, maybe to convict him, maybe to give him an opportunity to repent. We don't know for sure. But for us, the application is, though Jesus was betrayed and abandoned by his closest friends, he promises to always be with us in whatever we go through. Have you ever had a situation where um, you thought people had your back? You thought your friends were there, that they were going to kind of look out for you, stand up for you? I'll never forget a, a story that uh, my mom told us as kids that... Uh, when she was going through school, there was a girl that was picking on her, knocked her books out and did all this stuff, and uh, they, they decided they were going to have a fight after school. I mean, those of you that know my mom, it's almost hilarious to think of my mom being in a physical fight with somebody, but, you know, this was in her stronger days when she was, you know, five foot, 105 maybe, I don't know. <laughs> But she was only confident that she could stand up to this girl because all of her friends said, we'll be there with you. Guess what happened? They were all gone. And she got beat up pretty good, I think. Um, and that was probably a lesson for her. You can't always trust those who said they're going to have your back. And Jesus kind of experienced the same thing. I mean, Peter said, I'll never deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. But yet he went through it alone by himself. And he promises that that'll never happen to us. So he'll be with us every step of the way. Listen to Hebrews 13, the end of 5 and verse 6. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or abandon you. Therefore, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? 
The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That's something we need to tell ourselves. We need to, to, to rest on that, to stand on that. The Lord is my helper. Or I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? So Jesus knew of his coming suffering and death, yet he willingly continued to minister. He didn't say, you know what, guys? Stop fighting among yourselves. You know what I'm going through? No. He, he, he tried to figure out what their needs were, and he ministered to them. He wanted to prepare them for what would happen. Even Judas, the betrayer. And he encouraged them by revealing to them the coming of the Holy Spirit. If you want to do a great study on the Holy Spirit from the perspective of those that had not yet had the Holy Spirit, um, look at John 14 and John 16, and he talks about the Comforter, and he talks about why it's good for him to go away because uh, God was going to send the Comforter who would be with them forever. And so that promise continues to today. Jesus is present with us through the Holy Spirit living in us. And then thirdly, Jesus institutes his last supper. Look at verses 22 through 26. As they were eating, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them and said, take, take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank from it. He said to them, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will no longer drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink of it anew in the kingdom of God. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So here they are, they're celebrating Passover, they're in the midst of the meal, and Jesus kind of shifts gears. And he brings out a new meaning to the bread and to the wine, and he's using it as a way for them to remember him. It says he took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and passed it to his disciples, telling them, take it, this is my body. You know, I know there are some churches, maybe you grew up in those churches, that teach that this is literally his physical body. Um, but here in this fellowship, we, we believe it represents his body. And I think there are a number of reasons. And one of the professors that I studied under, Dr. Tom Constable, uh, he made a couple comments that I want to draw from. He said, they were eating actual unleavened bread. They were not eating human flesh. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can taste the difference between bread and meat. And so if this was really, literally, physically Jesus' body, I think you could taste a difference, right? I'm not trying to be funny. I'm just saying this is, this is why we... We, we don't believe that it is his literal uh, flesh, that it represents his flesh. It helps us remember his body and his life. Uh, another thing is, this would have been extremely abhorrent or gross or terrible for Jews because they never would eat human flesh or they wouldn't drink any kind of blood, much less uh, human blood. Um, also, and I thought I never uh, heard this before, never thought about this, all the other elements of the Passover were symbolic, not literal. They had bitter herb, which represented the bitterness of slavery. They had stewed fruit, which reminded them of the color of the bricks that they had made as slaves. They had roasted lamb that reminded them of God's passing over their household. So there's symbols all throughout Passover. And so for Jesus to talk about the bread representing his body and the wine representing his blood, it isn't a stretch at all for that to be a symbol or a, a, a token of remembrance rather than something literal. In fact, I think the weight of evidence is much harder for someone who says that it is truly his actual blood or his actual flesh in these elements. Remembering Jesus' body reminds us that the eternal Son of God became human and lived a perfect life and died in our place. It says, he took a cup, gave thanks, gave it to them and said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And so the wine or the juice represents his blood which was shed for us as he died on the cross. And his death ratified God's new covenant. The word for covenant here 
in the original language in Koine Greek is diatheke, which represents an agreement made by one person for the benefit of others. And I think that's significant because our salvation is not like a joint effort. Like God does this part and then we got to do this part. Um, it's a completed promise made by God alone through the death and resurrection of Jesus for all who believe. So our part is to trust, uh, to believe. Well, that isn't a work. That isn't like doing something um, in partnership with what God did. It's simply saying, yeah, thank you, I'll take it. I, I believe that what you said is true and I'll receive it. It's not a, a work on our part. It's not something we're contributing to the work of salvation. So it's not a two-way covenant based on both sides' actions. It's a one-way covenant. It's a fulfilled and finished agreement made by God alone. And also he said this was to anticipate his return and the promise of God's coming kingdom. Um, verse 15, or actually, yeah, is it verse 15? Anyway, he talks about the fact that I'm not going to uh, drink it again until I come into the kingdom. So finally, in the last application thought, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you've put your faith in him for the forgiveness of your sin and eternal life, you're saved. You're going to heaven. You have your sins forgiven. And we invite you to remember him with us as we participate in the Lord's Supper. Let's bow our heads. Scripture tells us to examine our hearts before we come to the table, before we receive the, the bread and the, the cup, to make sure that we indeed have put our trust in Jesus Christ. And so I, I feel like it's just so crucial for us to pause and ask ourselves, is this something I've done? Or have I somehow thought maybe because I was raised in a Christian home, then I'm okay. Or maybe because my mom and dad are strong Christians, I'm okay. You're not okay. It needs to be individual. It needs to be personal. You need to have come to that point in your life where you've realized, you know what? By myself, I'm never going to make it to heaven. I'm never going to be good enough. I can't fulfill God's commands. I'm sinful and I need a Savior. And I believe in Jesus Christ as my Savior, and I trust in Him, and I accept Him as my personal Lord and Savior. And if you've done that, you can have the assurance of your salvation, that you're part of God's family, that you're going to heaven. And if you haven't, do that today, even right now. There isn't a class you need to take. There isn't some special instruction. It's just simply come before God and admit your need. Agree with him that you've blown it, you've sinned, you haven't, you haven't done what he wants, but Jesus did for you, and he paid the penalty of your sin, and right where you're seated, right now, in this moment, you can know that you're forgiven by simply saying, Lord Jesus, I, I believe in you, come into my life and be my Savior, be my Lord, and if you've done that, then we'd love for you to join with us in celebrating the gospel, Jesus, his life and his death by taking of these elements as a remembrance of him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Can I have the men come forward, uh, the ushers and...